I don't know about y'all, but I think they need to take that on the road. <laughs> Philip, buddy, yeah. I need to borrow your fingers sometime. I'd like to learn how to do Can you teach me? <laughs> <laughs> well, your dad has done an excellent job teaching you. You're doing great. You keep that up, using your talents to honor the Lord. Well, how many of you like to read the newspaper? What's your favorite part of the newspaper? The comics, exactly. <laughs> there we go. I used to take the rest of it, just throw it off to the side, and get to the comic section. That's all I cared about. <laughs> it, at least you can find some good, funny stuff in the comics. But I'm going to invite you this morning. We're not going to be looking at the comics, but I do have an illustration to share with you here in just a moment. But I'm going to invite you to grab your copy of God's Word. And turn with me to the book of 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 is where we're going to be. But, you know, life can be challenging. There can be lots of things that come up in our lifetime that are not easy. Lots of things come our way that we don't uh, like. It, it, life can be a struggle. And there's a comic strip, speaking of comic strips, that came out in 1965. The title of it was The Born Loser. The Born Loser, and one of the main characters in this comic is Brutus P. Thorny Thornapple. That's a funny name, but it has some symbolic meaning there to it. You know, he's going through a lot of stuff in his lifetime. As the comic's name implies, he is a born loser. The man just simply cannot catch a break. Every episode of this cartoon or every clip of this cartoon shows him involved in some kind of trouble going on, some kind of challenge in life, it, it, whether it involves his job, his family, or just plain everyday life. And he's an old-fashioned kind of guy, and maybe that's the problem with him that the modern times, they seem to be running him over. He just doesn't catch up with what's going on. If things are happening to him and, and life is just beating him down, so he's earned the title, The Born Loser. He just can't win, no matter what he does, no matter what he tries. Well, there are a lot of people that find themselves in the same situation today. But here's the thing. In God's family, there are no born losers. Nobody is a born loser in God's family. God has given believers everything necessary to win. There's nothing that we're going to face that we don't have the divine resources at our disposal for. We have everything we need to overcome anything that comes our way when we have Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We have all of the divine resources we need. We sing the familiar hymn, Victory in Jesus. But do we really live like we have it? Like we have victory in Jesus. We have some natural enemies that are incredibly powerful. We have natural en enemies, natural adversaries, folks that are against us. Things that are against us. And there's three of these I want to talk to you about this morning. Three of these natural, powerful enemies that come to mind are, first of all, spiritual adversaries. Then we have recurring anxieties. And then we have the attraction of the world. All three of these things are a challenge to us. They are enemies to us as a believer. They are things that try to rob us of our joy. To rob us of our relationship with Christ. And sometimes it, it seems overwhelming. But as we're going to see this morning, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can live, as my title suggests, the overcoming life. To live the overcoming life. Now, if you have your Bible and you turn there to 1 John chapter 4, please stand with me. And we'll begin reading in verse 1. Verse 1 of 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, says this. And I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible this morning. It says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. 
This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming. Even now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and you have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Would you join me in prayer? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity right now to hear from your word. Father, I ask that you would bless the reading of your word. I ask that you would just take it and, and, and plant it in our hearts this morning that we can draw from it what you want us to know. Father, hide me behind the cross and you take center stage and speak to us today. Help us to worship you in a way that's pleasing and honorable to you, that brings honor and glory to your name. Father, just allow us to, to spend a little time in your presence right now, in this moment. Remove every distraction from our hearts and minds and help us to focus on you today. The King of kings and Lord of lords, we give you praise and honor and glory and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, verse 4 is the key verse for us this morning. Verse 4 of our text, as we figure out ways of overcoming our natural enemies, first of all, I want us to look at overcoming spiritual adversaries. To overcome our spiritual adversaries. These are things that affect our spiritual life. These are things that affect our spiritual relationship with God. When you look at verses 1 through 3, you, you recognize that our spiritual enemies are always active. They, they challenge us by speaking through false prophets. Think about what's happening around us today. There are so many voices telling people what to believe. And it's often hard to determine what source to trust in. What source is telling you the truth? What's the reality of what's going on? How do I find absolute truth? Is there absolute truth? Who do I listen to? Is it Fox? Is it CNN? Is it ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN? Where, where, what station do you listen to? What gives you the truth? What newspaper do you read to get the truth from? What, where do you go? What source do you go to? Who's giving the most accurate information? Is it the World Health Organization? Is it the CDC? Who is it? Is it our state? Is it our federal government? Who's giving us the truth of what's going on in our world today? I'm not talking about just coronavirus. I'm talking about life in general. Well, I'm going to tell you who's going to give you the truth. God's word gives you the truth. Only God gives you the truth of what's going on. Especially when it comes to spiritual matters. There's a way to get to the truth and it is by testing the spirits as he tells us here in this passage. But the challenge for us is to test these spirits and see if they are from God. That's where we fall short many times. We don't test the spirit. We just go with it. We take it in. We, we, we take it like it's the gospel truth. When somebody tells us something, we take it in like it's already fact and it's already been proven. Instead of testing it against what God's word says. If somebody came up to you and told you that the sky was purple, would you believe them? Probably some of us would run out to the door and look out to make sure that it hadn't changed or find out why it was purple. No, we have the, the facts before us. The sky has always been blue, right? Why would it be purple? Why would, would it suddenly have changed? And we want to find out why. Why do we do that? Because it is ingrained in us. It's been taught in us. We've had the truth revealed to us over time. The same is true in our spiritual lives. If we've had the truth ingrained in us, if we have studied the truth and we know God's word and we know what it says, we know when to, to resist the message of something that's false. So here he gives us the test. Testing the spirits. If the spirits don't confess Jesus as Lord, then they're known as the spirit of the Antichrist. Notice he didn't say it is the Antichrist. He said it is the spirit of the Antichrist. And friends, one of these days, the Antichrist, the person, is going to come on the scene. But there are things in the spirit of the Antichrist that support the Antichrist that are already at work in our world today. If you break that word apart, Antichrist, anything can be Antichrist. Antichrist. Christ against Christ. Anything that is against Christ is your spiritual adversary. 
And so we have to challenge ourselves to test those spirits to see if they're from God. To see if they are anti-Christ. If they are, then they're not to be trusted to tell you the truth. Because the enemy, the devil, he's sneaky. And he is the father of lies. And deception is his main tool. That's his specialty. He likes to deceive people. He likes to give you a half-truth. Well, friends, you've heard me say before, a half-truth is still a whole lie. It doesn't matter if the devil's feeding you something, you better check it out. Because he is the father of lies. He's the father of deception. He uses whatever methods he can to get us to listen to someone other than God. He uses many schemes that sometimes seem harmless to draw us in and away from Jesus. He uses things like science sometimes. Science is not bad. Science is, is, is how we prove things in nature a lot of times. But you know what? If, if you don't take science along with God's word, it's not worth anything. Because God created science. God created everything that's been created. But the devil has taken it and has misused it to try to pull us away from that truth of God being on the throne and being in charge. The most effective weapon against the enemy, against our spiritual adversary, is to arm ourselves by putting on the whole armor of God. You read about that in Ephesians 6, verse 11. Yeah, turn with me there to Ephesians 6 for just a moment. Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 11. Let's see what it says. Ephesians 6, verse 11, again in this Christian Standard Bible, says this. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. The first step in overcoming these adversaries is realizing that human beings are not our adversaries. Human beings are not our spiritual adversaries. Our problems don't come from people. And you say, well, Brother Steve, I got some pretty tough people to deal with in my life, and I have some problems with some folks. No, you don't have a problem with the, the person themselves. You have a problem with what their thoughts are. You have a problem with the enemy working through them to come against you because you're a child of God. That's where our problem is. He says here, we, we don't have a problem. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. It's not flesh and blood that we're fighting against. It's the enemy and all of his minions that we fight against. As the sooner we realize that, if you're a believer today, the devil has a mark on you. There's a target on your back. He's coming after you because you belong to God. He doesn't want you belonging to God. He doesn't want you trusting in God. He doesn't want you following God because if you're following God, you're not following him. He wants to make you ineffective. But here, and he's talking about the authorities against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. He's not talking about the government, folks. He's not talking about the governor. He's not talking about the mayor. He's not talking about those people in places of authority. No, he's talking about the enemy that is in authority over this world below. God has allowed Satan to come down and mess up as much as he wants to. With the understanding that one of these days when Jesus sets back his foot back on this earth, it's all going to be made right. It's all going to be over with. Satan's going to not be able to do anything to us anymore. Realizing our enemy is not human beings, but instead our enemy is supernatural. Verse 12 confirms this. And once we know who we're up against and what we're up against, well, then we can arm ourselves to overcome. Putting on the whole armor of God putting on every bit of that armor each and every day, 
This is your weapon. This is your sword. Your God's word should be your defensive weapon. A sword is not necessarily an offensive. It's two-sided, okay? It's not just a defensive weapon, but it is an offensive weapon as well. God expects us to use it for both. Did you know that? He expects us to use his word to fend off the battles of the enemy as well as going out and telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ so that they can do the same. He's given us all that we need to overcome our adversaries. You see, the reason we can overcome is found within us. It's the fact that the one living within believers is the Holy Spirit. And as scripture says, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Who's he talking about? The Holy Spirit within us is greater than he that is in the world. The enemy is in the world. This is his playground right now. But praise God, the one who is within believers is stronger and more powerful than him. God is always more superior to the enemy. No matter what the enemy is, no matter who the enemy is. It's a reminder that believers must hold on to find encouragement to press on toward the mark that the Apostle Paul wrote about in Scripture. And when we embrace this, we can expect to overcome. If you don't ever embrace that fact that God is on your side, if you don't ever accept him as Lord and Savior, then you're missing out. You're missing out on the opportunity to overcome whatever it is that's holding you back. Let's look at another thing this morning. Let's look at overcoming recurring anxieties. Man, there have been more anxiety pills, anti-anxiety pills on, put on the market in the last several years than ever in history. Have you noticed that that's our answer in the world today is, if you got a problem, there's a pill for that, or there's a medicine for that, or there's a shot for that. We want to fix it away with, with some kind of medicine. We want to apply something to it. That, that We just want to throw something at it to see if it works. And I think it causes just as much anxiety dealing with 15 pills in the morning. In my hand, when I go to my pill box every morning to take them for diabetes and high blood pressure and cholesterol and all these other things, it's, it's discouraging to think that you've got to take a handful of pills for your body to function and do right. And so we, we try to do that, but we have anxiety that comes in our life. Another word for anxiety is fear. The devil feeds on fear. It is fuel for him. Let's look at 1 John 4 verse 18. Verse John 4, verse 18. This verse says this, There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. The first step in faith is responding to God's love. There's no fear in love. Responding to God's love brings about faith. When we respond to the great love that God tells us about in his word, then we put our faith in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but should have everlasting life. When we respond to that kind of love and we take it in and we believe it and we live like we believe it, we should have no fear. We should have faith to face anything that comes our way. Anxiety is a form of fear. And fear and faith are total opposites. God's word tells us that perfect love, the kind of love that comes only from God, casts out fear. Now, I know there are some things that come into our lives that are huge. They're major. They're bigger than we are. And we don't know how to handle them. They catch us off guard. They knock us off our feet. There's depression in our world. There's anxiety. There's fear. There's sickness. There's all of these things going on. But the God that I serve is bigger than all of that. 
I don't have to give in to all of that. And there's nothing wrong with taking. But I'm, don't, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying if, if you need anxiety medicine, by all means, take it. God put it here for a reason. God gave man the, the knowledge to make it for a reason. As long as you don't abuse it, if you're doing what it's supposed to be used for, by all means, let it bless you by healing you and helping you. But God brings a comfort and a peace that a pill can never give you. God brings that peace and that comfort to face challenges and face things that you've never faced before that you won't find in a pharmacy. Perfect love casts out fear. And knowing that our Creator loves us enough to sacrifice His only Son so that we can have eternal life and forgiveness that we don't deserve should make us unafraid. God was not afraid to sacrifice His only Son, so we should not be afraid to receive that gift and live not in fear, but in confidence of knowing that He is on our side. You see, it should dissolve our fears, including our anxiety. Saving love, it's a keeping love. It's one that won't let go. And we don't have to fear because we can know that God loves us. We can know that he's going to keep us from the day we pray to receive him all the way through eternity. That's what I love about salvation. When you make the decision to receive Christ, to reach out to him, to save you, once you're saved, you're placed in God's hand and there's nothing that can take you out of it. He's got his hold on you and he will never, ever, ever let go. But the problem is, we're not willing to let go to allow him to latch on to us. We're not willing to surrender to him. You see, he will keep us from that day of salvation all the way through eternity. But the enemy, he wants us to focus on the storm instead of the master of the storm. Anxiety will rob you of peace. It will rob you of joy. It will bring torment. But embracing God's love, that's where you find perfect peace. That's where you find complete peace. But it's a choice we have to make. It's a choice we must make to look to him instead of what the enemy is throwing at us. We have to look to Jesus <clears throat> instead of what the enemy wants us to be focused on and distracted by. To overcome this recurring anxiety, we must rest in the perfect love of the Savior. The perfect love of the Father. Look with me now to 1 John chapter 5. Verses 1 through 4. 1 John 5. Verses 1 through 4. My Bible is just a page over there. 1 John 5. 1 through 4 says. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ. Has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father. Also loves the one born of him. This is how we know that we love. God's children. When we love God. And obey his commands. For this is what love for God is, to keep his commands. And his commands are not a burden, because everyone who has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. We have victory because we have conquered the world, not on our own, but through Christ living in us. The Holy Spirit within us helps us to conquer the world, to overcome our recurring fears, our recurring anxieties. Well, there's one other area I want us to look at, one area of overcoming I want us to, to check out this morning, and it is overcoming the attraction of the world. Overcoming the attraction of the world. As I was coming into Milan last night, I, I was topping the little hill there and I looked over to the right and there were some flashing lights going on and it was just just bright it didn't look like there was six or eight state troopers sitting on the side of the road but it wasn't you know what it was it was a little carnival over here and it caught my attention because it was flashing and there was all different colored lights and all this stuff I couldn't miss it 
It was dark out and it was just shining in the night like a beacon. It was flashing over and over. It, it, it was an attraction. The billboards on the side of the road, they're put there for a purpose. They take our attention. They, they <laughs> attract us to the message that they have on them. We find out information on those billboards that tells us about things that we want to go see, things we want to go do. And there's, they'll be miles away from the attraction. Have you ever noticed that? I was way off somewhere in, near East Tennessee not too long ago, and I noticed a billboard for the safari park down around Alamo. All the way on the other end of the state, they're advertising to attract people to come all the way there. And you know what? It works because that place is jam-packed with cars almost all the time. But there is an attraction. There's an attraction factor. The world wants to attract Christians to be drawn away. They want to attract lost people to be pulled away from Christ. They want people to love the world more than they do Jesus. And it's wrong. But there's a way for us to overcome the attraction, the lure of the world. In order to do that, we must develop a love for Christ that's stronger than the love we have for the world. Listen to these words. 1 John 2, verses 15 and 17 says this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. The world has many attractions. The world has many things that pique our interest. The devil has done an excellent job of luring people away from God by using our senses, by using the things that we like to do, by using our interests, things that, that are we're unable to resist on our own. You see, many of these attractions are things that on our own we're not able to resist them. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the big one, pride in one's possessions. They make walking the Christian walk difficult. They make it hard to be a believer. They make it hard to live like a believer in a world that's lost and broken and fallen. Because the tendency is to go with the crowd. If everybody else is doing it, it must be okay. Well, I don't think so. Just because everybody's drinking a bottle of poison doesn't make it all right, does it? I don't think I want to do that. A man named Jim Jones was able to convince people to do that one time. But the world has attractions. When we're listening to the wrong voices, it pulls us the wrong way. and We're not able to resist it on our own. The enemy knows all of this. He uses it against us. And faith is our key to overcoming it all. Having faith in Jesus Christ is the only way to overcome the lure and the attraction of the world. It's the only way to develop a love for the Savior that died for you and died for me. Faith in Him. Believing in someone that you can't see and do something that you cannot do for yourself. And it's eternal. Faith is, <clears throat> excuse me, faith is what or who you put your trust in. What we set our eyes upon, it determines our course. Whatever our, our heart, <clears throat> whatever has our heart determines our devotion. What we take pride in determines what's important in our life. Faith that comes from rebirth that he's talking about here is the victory that overcomes the attraction of the world. We are born again. We are reborn when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. We're not the same person that we were before coming to Christ. We're not supposed to be. We're supposed to look totally different than what we used to.
If you go through the waters of baptism and your life is not changed, if you're saved and you follow in believers' baptism and you go through the waters of baptism, you come out and people can't tell any difference in you, chances are you know what you did? You just got wet. You came in a sinner on one side and you went out the other side a wet sinner. It's about commitment. Faith that comes from rebirth is the victory that overcomes the attraction of the world. So what's the benefit of the overcoming life? Why is it so important for us to live the overcoming life? Why should we strive to overcome these enemies? What's in it for us? Well, I'll tell you, the benefit of the overcoming life in Revelation 2.11, it holds a marvelous promise. Listen to what it says. Revelation 2.11 says, let any, and these are Jesus' words, by the way, let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will never be harmed by the second death. Folks, the reward is eternal life. The reward for overcoming is eternal life. And what better reward is there? Well, there's something else here in Revelation 2, verse 17. Let anyone, again, Jesus' words, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone. And on the stone, a new name is inscribed that no one knows except the one who receives it. You see, when we overcome, we get a new name. We get a new identity. We get the pronouncement of being found not guilty of our sins because of what Jesus did on the cross and us trusting in that and believing he's who he is, who he says he is. To have the overcoming life, it requires first that we come to faith in Jesus. It, it takes agreeing with God that we've sinned. And we can't do anything about our sin on our own. And we have to accept the free gift of forgiveness through Jesus. And then it takes following him in obedience. Overcoming. It takes a commitment to surrender. Have you made that commitment this morning? Have you surrendered your all to Jesus Christ? Would you like to? Would you like to come and let us share in that decision today? You see, you're not alone in this. Are you a believer this morning that's not as close to Jesus as you need to be? The invitation's still there to come back, to make things right. Here in just a moment, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. We're going to give you the opportunity to get along with God, to do business with God face to face. Join me in prayer. Father, this morning we want to thank you again for the saving power of Jesus. The saving power of Jesus' blood. Father, we thank you that you loved us enough to give your one and only son to die on a cross so that we could have eternal life. There may be somebody here this morning that's never experienced that. They didn't know what that's about. God, I encourage them to come to find out what it's about, to surrender to you. Father, there may be a Christian here this morning that's gone astray that maybe needs to come back to you. Maybe they want to have a fresh new experience with you walking from this day forward in fellowship with you. Father, I don't know what the needs are on the hearts this morning, but you do because you've made us. Have your will and your way during this time of invitation, Father, your invitation for us to come and do business with you. Even just to come and pray, Father, to get alone with you right now in this place, in this moment. We love you, Father. We praise you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.